Hello and welcome to Lost Love Chronicles. Over and over again, he kept experiencing the same thing. A bright flash of light, followed by searing pain, then darkness. From time to time, he would hear voices, but couldn't make out who they were from or what they were saying. He tried to speak, but couldn't. He tried to move, but was unable to. This time, however, the light was different. It was like looking through a fog, but he couldn't make anything out and he couldn't focus on anything. Shadowy figures passed before him, and he tried calling out, but couldn't. He began hearing noises, but nothing he heard made any sense. He forced himself to move, but wasn't able to. He tried screaming, but nothing came out. Exhausted, he stopped to rest and the darkness came over him again. A while later, he didn't know how long, the light returned. He willed himself to move and was finally able to, but it took all of his strength. He tried to yell, but the only thing that came out was a sickly gurgle. He felt like something was in his throat keeping him from talking. A shadow moved in front of him, stopped for a moment, and then ran off, making a loud noise. He saw more shadows, this time coming closer and gathering around him. He blinked his eyes, hoping to clear his vision. The shadows moved quickly around him doing things to him he couldn't understand. Then he heard someone speak. Mr. Smith, can you hear me? A man's voice said. Who the hell was Mr. Smith? He wondered. Nevertheless, he could hear the man and tried nodding his head. It took a lot of work, but he finally managed a weak nod. As his vision began to clear, he could tell that he was in a hospital bed and the people around him, all dressed in medical garb, were working frantically to bring him back to consciousness. A man he presumed was a doctor mentioned something about seeing if he could breathe on his own. Soon, he felt tape being pulled off his face, and something was being pulled out of his throat. Panting, he suddenly realized his throat was clear of obstruction, and he took a few tentative breaths on his own, relishing the feel of inhaling air on his own. Good, good, the man said. As he looked around, he could see a number of wires attached to his body along with a blood pressure cuff on his upper arm and in four inserted into his lower arm. He could also feel the catheter that had been placed inside his penis. Looking on the wall, he saw the thinnest television he had ever seen in his life and noticed the cheering along the bottom of the screen that said something about a President Trump. Trump? He asked himself. How long had he been here? The last he knew Barack Obama had only been in the White House for a few months. How long? He asked, weakly. The doctor looked at his thick chart before answering. From what I can tell, about ten years, Mr. Smith, he said. Ten years? What the hell happened? And who was this Smith guy they all referred to? He wondered. Just relax, Mr. Smith. We're going to check you out and get you set up for rehab. As he watched, the nurses took his arms and legs out of the restraints holding him in the bed and the doctor made adjustments in his notes. He looked at another nurse before speaking. Do we have Mr. Smith's contact information available? He asked. A young nurse looked in her computer and answered in the affirmative. Very well, reach out and let them know. The nurse began making a call, and the man wondered who would be coming to see him. His memory was still a bit foggy, but he remembered being married with an eight-year-old daughter. My God, he thought, my daughter, Jenny, would be 18 now and probably ready to go to college. He thought about his wife, Lydia, but for some reason didn't seem to interested in seeing her. Something about seeing his wife, he wasn't quite sure what, actually repulsed and angered him. Well, Mr. Smith, the doctor said, your vitals look good, but we're going to run some tests anyway. Once we get those back, we'll get this feeding tube out of you and get you up to your room. You're going to be our guest for a little while, but we'll get you into a rehab facility and get you back on your feet, okay? The man nodded. Doctor, he said, who's Smith? The doctor looked down at his notes before looking back at him. Why, you are, he said. It seems you may be experiencing some amnesia. I'm not surprised, really. You've been through a lot. That's okay. We'll get someone in to work with you. Now, you just relax and we'll get you set up. With that, the doctor left, giving instructions to a couple of nurses on his way out. The man knew who he was, and it wasn't this Smith character. His name was Avery Wilson. He was born in 1972 to Dan and Barbara Wilson. He had a brother, Robert, who was a year older than him. He joined the army at 18 right out of high school and was trained to become a sniper. 
He spent the next four years in various trouble spots around the world, including Kuwait. He survived Desert Storm and finally got out in 1994 and went home to Southern California, where he completed his associate degree in criminal justice in 1996. He had always wanted to be a policeman, so he joined the LAPD, where his military training was put to use. After graduating from the police academy, he was made a sharpshooter in 1997. He met Lydia Jackson and after two years of dating, married her in 1999. Things were great, he thought, and their daughter, Jennifer, came along in October 2000. He stayed with the force while his wife worked as an attorney for the same firm where his brother was a partner. He won a rather large lottery in late 2008 and things went downhill from there. About the time he won the lottery, he learned quite by accident that his wife had been in a long-standing affair with his brother. Fortunately, his good friend and confidant, Ben Jacobs, had talked him into letting him set up an overseas account under a different name so Lydia couldn't access most of his lottery winnings. Ben, being an expert on things financial, managed the account for him. He also put him into contact with a real shark of an attorney who hated cheating spouses and hated Robert even more. He also set up surveillance on Lydia and Robert and had managed to get pictures and video of their trysts. He had planned on confronting his wife about her affair, but something happened. He couldn't remember the details of that night, but he was sure that it would all come back to him soon. The next thing he remembered was waking up in this hospital ward ten years later. Exhausted, he laid his head back down and watched the television as the nurses did their jobs. But who was this Smith character? What was that all about? He considered his life as he watched the local news. According to the news, a Robert Wilson had declared himself to be a candidate for public office. He wondered if this Robert Wilson could possibly be his brother. As he watched, a well-dressed man with a bit of gray at his temples addressed a group of people outside a building somewhere in downtown Los Angeles. Next to him were two women, Lydia and a teenage girl who looked like a grown-up version of his Jenny. And I promise the people of this great state that I'll bring ethics and accountability back into our state government, Robert said to some fanfare. Sacramento is out of control, and we get to get back to basics. After this, Robert turned and kissed Lydia on the cheek. She was two years younger than Avery and, he thought, had the best looks money could buy. Wilson, who was joined by his wife and daughter, made his announcement this afternoon and is already ahead in the polls. Since the tragic shooting death of his brother, Avery, in 2009, Wilson has worked with the families of fallen police officers, the news announcer said, showing a picture of him in his police uniform. What the hell? The man thought as he watched the report. Death? I'm not dead, you a-hole, he said to himself. And what's this about Jenny being Robert's daughter? He laid his head back down and tried to remember the last few days before he ended up in the hospital but his mind kept drawing a blank. His mind wandered back over the main events of his life, hoping to find an answer. He thought about Robert, his older brother. For as long as he could remember, Robert was the bane of his existence. Not only was he a bully, he delighted in taking whatever he could from his younger brother. Money, credit for whatever he did. His possessions, even his girlfriends. It seemed that no matter what he had, Robert wanted it whether he needed it or not. Worse yet, his parents went along with whatever Robert said or did. And if Robert did something wrong, he always turned it around so his parents would end up punishing the younger sibling. He grew up hating his older brother. And the crap he put up with from his parents didn't help. Robert was the good son who would make something of himself, leaving Avery to be the black sheep. It was so bad that he never told his family he had enlisted. He had just graduated from high school and was off to boot camp the next day. He had signed the enlistment papers one day after school was out, went through all the physicals and was set to go. No one even knew where he was until he was forced to call home. You did what? His father roared when he called. You get your bum back home right now, young man. Avery said. I'm over 18 and I'm already in boot camp. And there's not a goddamn thing you can do about it. Don't expect to hear from me again. And with that, he slammed the phone down, ending the call. He kept his word and never communicated with any of them until he graduated from the police academy in 1997. That wasn't his choice, by the way. They learned from the LAPD that he would be graduating and showed up to see him. He never forgot that day. He spotted them while standing in formation. After the speeches, 
They stood to receive their certificates and he saw them, including Robert, watching as he became the newest officer on the force. After the ceremony, he tried his best to get away quickly, but was stopped when they blocked his path. And they didn't look too happy. You're not getting away from us again, Avery, his father said. I knew you'd finally make something of yourself. I had hoped you would have gone to college to be a lawyer like your brother and I. Robert smirked, but the smirk quickly left his face. Yeah, well, this is my choice and it's something shithead here can't take from me, Avery said, glancing at Robert. And for your information, I did make something of myself in the army. Avery, please, his mother, Barbara, said. We haven't seen or heard from you in seven years. Can't you please be civil to us just once? Maybe if just once you and dad had given me some benefit of the doubt, things would have been different. But no, you always listened to him. Always took his side in everything and never once gave me the time of day, he said. This is MY day, and I'll be damned if I'm going to have you screw it up for me. Avery, Robert said. I don't get it. Why do you hate me so much? Are you kidding me? You were a bully. You took everything I ever had, even my girlfriends, he said. You blamed me for every shitty thing you did. And you got them to believe all of your lies, he added, motioning to his parents. His parents were shocked to hear him talk this way. He was always so quiet, so polite. Who is this man before them, they wondered. So guess what, a hole? I'm through with you. I've paid my dues and I'm making my own life. So stay out of it, he told Robert, his eyes burning with hatred. Avery, son, what happened to you? His mother asked, shocked at her son's language. This wasn't the same quiet man who took whatever they dished out to him. He looked at his mother. I grew up, mother, he said. I became a soldier, and you know what? I've even killed men. She backed up a bit after hearing that. He continued. Don't worry, mother. They were all bad guys and deserved it. I'm not the same person who grew up in your house, and I don't take crap off of anyone. He looked at Robert before continuing. Ever. He turned and walked away from them, leaving them open mouth. He didn't see them again until the day he married Lydia. He met her at a police event shortly after becoming a cop. At the time, she worked in the public defender's office but was looking for a job with a major firm. He proposed a year to the day they met, and she accepted. They decided to have a long engagement to make sure things would work out and got married a year later. Divorces were quite common among police officers. He never invited his family to the wedding, but they showed up anyway. He saw them during the reception, when Lydia pointed them out. Isn't that your family? She asked, pointing to his parents and Robert. Yeah, he said. I don't know why they're here. You have to introduce me. Please, she begged. Avery gave in and walked his bride over to them. They smiled as Avery introduced his wife. Well, it's so good to finally meet you, Avery's father said. I don't understand, Avery. Why didn't we get an invitation to your wedding? His mother asked. Must have been an oversight or something, Avery said. The truth was, he never invited them. I hear you're going to be joining our firm soon, Dan said. Avery looked shocked as Lydia looked at him. Oh, I'm sorry, Avery, didn't you know? The board just accepted her today. No, I didn't know, Avery said as Robert smirked. I'm sorry, Avery. I didn't know I had been accepted until just now, Lydia said. Avery nodded his head. That's okay, dear, he said. We'll talk about it later. Mind if I have a dance with my new sister-in-law? Robert asked with a shit-eating grin. Avery pulled him off to the side and spoke to him in a quiet tone of voice so no one else could hear. Listen up, a-hole, he told his older brother. This isn't high school. She's my wife, not some schoolgirl. I understand. Robert responded condescendingly. Avery grabbed his shoulder. No, you don't. Do you know what I did in the army? Robert shook his head. No, I assume you were some kind of clerk or something, Robert said. No, I was a sniper. I killed scumsucker like you for a living, and I can blow your balls off from 1,000 yards away. Understand? The smirk left Robert's face, and he looked at his younger brother, shocked. Is that a threat, Avery? He asked. Avery shook his head. No, a-hole. It's a goddamn promise, he replied. Okay, Avery, I got it, Robert said. Hands off. Message received.
They walked back to Lydia and his parents. May I have a dance, please? Robert asked in a respectful tone of voice. Lydia looked at Avery, who nodded his head in permission. What did you tell him? His father asked after they left. I gave him a bit of sage brotherly advice, watching his wife and brother dance. He was relieved to see they kept a respectful distance from each other. He turned back to his father. You know, Robert always managed to take my girlfriends when we were in school. I know, Avery, his father said. Believe me when I tell you I didn't approve of it. Yeah, well, you never did anything to stop it, either. Even when he rubbed it in my face right in front of you, Avery told him. This is different. She's my wife. And I damn well expect you to enforce your firm's morals clause. I understand, Avery, his father said. Look, I'm sorry about everything that's happened, but it's all in the past. Can't we just put it behind us and move forward? Please, Avery, his mother added. Can you please set your hatred for us aside so we can be a family again? We'll see, mother, Avery said. Barbara smiled. That's all I ask. I know you don't believe me, but we really do love you and we're so proud of what you've done, she said. Avery nodded his head and accepted his mother's hug. Thank you, you're right. I don't believe you but deep down, I love you too. There's a lot of hurt that needs to heal. And you can start by making sure he doesn't get his hooks in my wife, he added, looking at his father. I understand, son. I'll take care of it personally. See that you do, as his wife and brother returned. As they left the reception for their honeymoon in Las Vegas, Avery turned to see Robert and his father discussing something quietly while looking at them. He hoped for the best, but experience had taught him to expect the worst. On the way to Vegas, Lydia talked to him about his relationship with his family. You know, your brother really is a very charming man, she said. He even asked me to call him Bobby. Said all his friends call him that. But you don't. And he's your brother. Why? Avery told her about his childhood. How his brother had taken everything he had. Even his girlfriends. He told her about the spankings and groundings he received for things his brother had done and how his parents always sided with Robert over him. So, when the time came to leave, I did, he said. I put it all behind me and built my own life. Oh my God, I never knew. And they never mentioned you at all. Honestly, if I had known any of this, I never would have applied at their firm. It's okay, Avery told her. But forewarned is forearmed. Watch out for Robert. He's trouble. And yes, his charm is just a tool to get his way. Trust me, I've seen it happen too many times. You can trust me, sweetie, she said. I'll never do anything to hurt you, ever. He believed her, but he lived by the motto, trust but verify. He kept an eye on her, what she wore to work, the time she had to work late, the way she smelled when she came home and her general demeanor. Two years after their marriage, Jenny was born. She was his little girl and could always be counted on to make him happy. Lydia turned out to be a great mother as well. For the first several years, his wife gave no indication that anything was wrong, not even at the firm's various parties and functions. He even started warming up to his parents a bit and let them spend time with their granddaughter. But he still kept an eye on things. If there was something happening, they were very good at covering it up. He met Ben Jacobs, an all-around master of all trades, who was into all sorts of things, financial planning, private investigations, you name it, at a police seminar in San Diego in November 2008. The two hit it off, especially since Ben was also an army veteran. They became fast friends and Avery felt like he could trust the man with his life. That was when he first learned of Lydia's cheating. The previous Christmas, he had bought two new Apple iPhones, which featured a virtual keyboard and allowed text messages to be sent. He kept one for himself and gave her the other. His reasoning was that they would help the two keep in touch no matter where they were. He was on his way back to their home in Los Angeles County when his phone dinged, letting him know he had a message. He looked at the screen and was shocked at what he saw. Had a great time tonight, lover. See you tomorrow, it said. He verified the text came from Lydia's phone and put the phone away. While he didn't know who the lover was, he suspected it was Robert, since he didn't know who else she might see on the next day and he knew they often worked together on various projects and cases. He had to come up with a plan before he got home, so he pulled off the freeway in Orange County and called Ben. Hey, Avery, what's up? Ben asked. Avery, 
I got a strange message on my phone, and I need some help. Think you could work as my PI for a little while? He asked. Sure, but it'll cost ya, Ben said. Yeah, okay. He explained what had happened, and Ben said he would start looking into it. In the meantime, don't do anything stupid, Ben said. Don't go blowing your brother's balls off. You hear me? Yeah, I hear ya. Give me some time. It might take me a bit to get some evidence you can use against them, especially since they've been so careful up until now, Ben told him. Okay, stay in touch, Avery replied. Will do, Ben said, ending the call. How could she? Avery asked himself. He fought back the tears but lost. Even now, he teared up, thinking about that day. The nurse's voice brought him back to the present day. Are you alright, Mr. Smith? The nurse asked. He suddenly realized he was crying and wiped his eyes. Yeah, he croaked through parched lips. Can I get something to drink? Sure, Mr. Smith. I'll be right back, she said, walking to the nurse's station. She came back a moment later with a cup of ice water. As he sipped on the water, the doctor came into the room. Well, good news, Mr. Smith, he said. All of your tests came back good. So we're going to get that feeding tube out of you and get you up to your room. A couple nurses came into the room and began working on him. Soon, he was being transported to a private room, where he actually got to eat real food for the first time in a decade. He watched the news as he ate, and when he was finished, he heard a knock on the door. Come in, he said, his voice still weak. Johnny boy, how are you doing? The man said as he came inside. Avery looked at him and didn't recognize him at first. It's me, Ben, remember? Yeah. I was just thinking about you, he said. Ben sat down next to Avery's bed and pulled up a briefcase after closing the door. How are you feeling? He asked as he opened the case. Avery nodded his head. Weak, but getting stronger. Tell me, Ben, what the hell happened? Why does everyone keep calling me Mr. Smith? And why did you call me Johnny? That's because Avery Wilson died ten years ago, Ben said. Avery or John looked at him, shocked. What? How? he asked. But I'm still alive. Ben shook his head. No, Avery is dead. Your name is John Smith. According to the official record, Avery was killed during a home invasion that took place when he went back to get some things out of his house. How much do you remember? The man shook his head. Ben pulled out a laptop and set it up in front of him. Watch this, he said, bringing up a video. The video showed his wife, Robert, and Dan in a hotel room. Lydia was having sex with Dan and Robert. After their climax, they sat on the bed and sipped their drink. Avery will be coming over tomorrow to get the rest of his things. Good, Dan said. We can take care of him then. He looked at Robert. Think you have the balls to blow your own brother away? Robert laughed. Seriously? He asked. Hell yes. I've been wanting to do that scumsucker in for a long time. Dan and Lydia smiled. See that you do, Dan said. Make it look like a home invasion and for crying out loud, clean yourself up good and don't leave anything behind. I got it under control, Robert said. As John sat, shocked at hearing his family plot to murder him, Ben brought up another video. This video showed Avery tied to a chair as Robert and Lydia were on the bed, naked, having sex. After they finished, they sat on the bed and looked at Avery, who was shaking his head. He tried to cry out, but was gagged and couldn't say anything. Robert grabbed a shotgun and pointed it at Avery as Lydia laughed. Well, well, look here, he said in the video. The stupid cuck is waking up, finally. Wakey, wakey. As Avery focused on the scene before him, he began struggling. Don't waste your time, little brother. What do you think? I've taken your wife in your bed right in front of you. Your daughter is really mine and now, I'm going to take your life, he said as Lydia laughed. He pointed the shotgun and fired once knocking Avery and the chair over. Is he dead? Lydia asked. Please tell me you killed him. Robert walked over to Avery and prodded the body with the shotgun. Getting no response, he put the shotgun down. Help me get him out of this chair, he told Lydia. It has to look like he was shot by a burglar. Lydia got off the bed and joined Robert, and the two of them took Avery out of the chair, arranging his body so it looked as though he was surprised and shot by an intruder. They took a shower changed clothes and left. The video ended, but picked up later when Avery's body was put on a gurney by paramedics. As they watched, 
Lydia and Robert were heard crying in the background. So you had video of Robert shooting me but did nothing with it? John asked. I had no choice, Ben said. The feds told me to bury it. It seems your father and brother were under investigation for work they've been doing with some rather shady characters. Organized crime? John asked. Ben nodded his head. Among other things, he said. Hell, who do you think is bankrolling your brother's run for the state senate? So how did I survive? John asked. Apparently someone upstairs really likes you, Ben said. There was a lot of damage, but fortunately, Robert is a much better lawyer than Shooter. It was a bit of a medical miracle that you survived at all. If you hadn't gone into a coma, the feds would have had you under witness protection. As it was, they were able to make it look as though you had died. They even got hold of a body that looked a lot like you for the funeral. Was Lydia there? John asked. Ben laughed as he nodded his head. Oh yeah, she played the grieving widow role to the hilt, Ben said. John laughed. What about Jennifer? John asked. She'll be going to college soon. She's missed you a lot and blames her mother for what happened. She's quite resourceful. You'd be real proud of her. So, who's been paying for all this? John asked. Well, you remember that lottery ticket you won? He asked. John nodded his head. You trusted me with it if you recall. So I made some investments and put it all in an offshore account. It's grown quite a bit, and that's what's been paying for your hospital stay. There's enough in that account to take care of you for the rest of your life if you're careful. Thank you for that, John said. My pleasure. So, what do you see happening from here on? I'd like to see my daughter, John said. And I need to get revenge on the a-holes who did this to me. All of them. Ben nodded his head. I understand, he said. I had a feeling you might say that. They talked for a while longer and discussed their plans for the future, which included revenge on Lydia, Robert, and Avery's parents. John even considered putting his sniper skills to use against them, but Ben talked him out of that. Wouldn't you rather see them suffer for a while first? Ben asked, a wicked smile coming over his face. What do you have in mind? John asked. His mood improved considerably as Ben laid out a potential plan. By the time Ben left, John was in a great mood. He even embraced his new identity with a vengeance. Oh yes, he thought to himself. They would all pay for what they had done to him. He spent the next few days in the hospital, getting stronger with each passing day. His mind went over the events that led to his shooting. He thought back to the final days of his previous life. December 2008. After Avery received the text message from Lydia, he authorized Ben to set up hidden cameras and microphones in his house. Ben went all out and even put hidden microphones in his wife's car. He had no idea where the devices were, which, he surmised, was probably a good idea. Ben somehow managed to get hidden cameras set up in their offices. He didn't know how his friend managed that and didn't ask. Two weeks after getting the text, he received an email from his friend to come by his office. Hey, Avery, Ben said as he walked in and shook hands. Are you ready for this? Avery shook his head. I don't know, he said. Ben nodded his head in understanding. It's not pretty. He held out a large packet of photos that showed Lydia and Robert in a variety of compromising positions. From what he could tell, all of their trysts took place either in a hotel room or their office. Some of the photos showed Lydia with both Robert and his father, Dan, at the same time. One photo showed his mother, Barbara, was also involved. It took everything he had to keep from getting sick. There's more, Ben said, starting a video on his computer. As Avery watched, Lydia was blowing his father's tool. He recognized his father's office. Once they finished, Dan poured them a drink and they settled into their seats, still naked. You know... We've been very careful to keep all this from Avery, but you know he's going to figure it out pretty soon, Lydia said. He may be a Boy Scout, but he's not stupid. Robert and his father laughed. Please, Robert said condescendingly. We've been doing this for, what, five or six years? He still hasn't figured it out yet. We could probably screw right in front of him, and he wouldn't know what's going on. Maybe we should fill him in this Christmas, he said. How about this? After dinner this Christmas, we slip him a little something and let him watch. We'll give him a little incentive, and if he doesn't go along with the program, then we revert to Plan B. Plan B? Lydia asked. You mean, let our friends from back east take him out? Something like that, Dan said. 
Your husband isn't the only sniper out there, you know? Lydia laughed. You think Barb will go along with that? Lydia asked. Who do you think came up with the idea? Dan said. Lydia lifted her glass. Well then, here's to Barb and Christmas dinner, she said, smiling. The two men joined her. Avery felt even sicker after the video ended. My God, he said. They're all in on it. Even my mother. Avery, you need to be very careful going forward, Ben said. There's other videos in here as well, and they're all just as bad. So far, they've been very careful. From what I've been able to determine, they've only been getting together about once a week or so, until just the last few months. Ben pulled out a business card. I've taken the liberty of setting you up with the meanest divorce layer in the area. I've already given her the evidence I've shown you, he said. Use my phone and set up an appointment. She's waiting to hear from you. Avery called and arranged to see the attorney that afternoon. What about their plot to take me out? Avery asked. I've provided that info to the FBI, Ben said, but I'm not convinced anything's going to come from it. Right now, it's just talk. There's no evidence to suggest anything has actually been arranged. The bottom line, Avery, is that you need to be very careful. Act normally, if you can. I know it's going to be hard, but you have to protect yourself. Anyway, keep in touch, and I'll let you know if I get anything else. Avery thanked his friend and headed out to see his attorney. He made it to the office of Sally McIntosh, his attorney. The receptionist ushered him in after he introduced himself. Good afternoon, Officer Wilson, Sally said, shaking his hand. Please call me Avery, Ms. McIntosh, he said. Only if you call me Sally, she said in response. She pulled out a large folder and got right to business. Avery was impressed. I already spoke with Ben, and he provided me with the evidence he collected. I must tell you, this is probably the most messed up situation I've ever seen in my career. So, what are you expecting out of this? Well, I'd like custody of my daughter, if she really is mine, and I don't want to give her any support. I'd also like to go after Robert and my ex-parents, he said. Sally nodded her head. You know that California is a no-fault state as far as divorce is concerned, Sally said. We can file under irreconcilable differences and use the evidence as a bargaining chip in the division of property. As for custody, I'm afraid you're going to be on the short end of the stick there as most judges here give custody to the mother. There's a chance that given your wife's earnings you might be able to get away without having to give her support. We can make that argument and see what the judge says. What about Robert and the rest of my family? He asked. Unfortunately, California law doesn't allow for lawsuits citing alienation of affection. We might be able to find other grounds for a lawsuit, but I'm not too sure anything will come of it. All right, Avery said. Do what needs to be done. When would you like to have her served? Sally asked. Avery thought for a moment. Christmas Day, he said. At my parents' house. Sally laughed. You're cold-blooded she said. Divorce for Christmas. I like it, given what I've seen. I'll also throw in an order of protection keeping her and your family as far away from you as possible. Thanks, Avery said. I'm really sorry about all this, Avery. You seem like a good man, Sally said, ending the meeting. Avery drove home in a fog, processing everything he had seen and heard. Never in his life would he have thought that his entire family would conspire against him like this. Lydia sensed that something was wrong and tried to approach him. What's wrong, dear? She asked. Avery shook his head in disbelief. I just have a lot on my mind, he said. One of my friends found out his wife is cheating on him. He's really taking it very hard. I'm sorry to hear that, she said. I'd never do that to you. Yeah, right, he thought. You know that, don't you? He looked at her before shaking his head. I hope to God you never do he said in a monotone. Lydia wasn't sure how to take this. Does he really know? She asked herself. He stayed in his study after she left and looked at the evidence Ben gave him. He shook his head in disbelief. Are you coming to bed? Lydia asked. Avery shook his head and waved her off. I've got a lot on my mind. You go on up, he said. He ended up sleeping on the couch in his study. Lydia woke him up the next morning. Why didn't you come to bed last night? She asked. I was looking forward to some loving. He looked at her in disbelief. I was just going through some things, he said. Well, you know we have our company Christmas party tonight. 
right? She asked. He nodded his head. I'll expect you at the office about 4.30 this afternoon, and I hope your mood improves before then. Yeah, sure, he said. She bent down to kiss him and hit his cheek as he turned his head. Love you, she said as she walked out. Yeah, me too, he said half-heartedly. Does he know? She asked herself as she walked out. That afternoon, Avery went to his wife's Christmas party, which was always held at the office where she worked. Robert met him as he walked in. Well, look who the cat dragged in, he said. His speech slurred from alcohol. Avery shook off the offer of a drink and grabbed a bottle of water. What, you're too good to drink with us now? Robert asked. I'm still on duty, Avery said, and I hope you're not planning to drive tonight. What, is little brother going to arrest me? Robert slurred. Only if you break the law, Avery said. Lydia and his father came up to him. Lydia went to kiss him, but he turned his head. Avery's threatening to arrest me, Robert said. Can you believe that shit? Dan looked at him. I'd probably arrest you too. After all you've had to drink, Dan said. He reached out to shake Avery's hand. Good to see ya, son. Come on in and join the party. Avery kept his hand on his sidearm and followed his father and wife. Lydia wrapped her arm around her husband's. Relax, she said. You look like you're expecting someone to attack you. Avery looked at his wife. Police in uniform are always targets. You know that, he said. He took in his surroundings and noticed the looks of pity he received. A few of Lydia's co-workers shook his hand and thanked him for his service, but he saw it in their eyes. They knew, all of them. After a while, he excused himself and went to the men's room. Robert was there, washing his hands. Avery saw the large diamond-encrusted Rolex on his arm. Nice watch, Avery said. Is that new? Robert took it off and handed it to Avery. Yeah, he said. It was a gift. Avery looked at it and turned it over. Merry Christmas. With all our love. Your two girls, Lydia and Jenny, the inscription said. Avery handed the watch back, taking in the smirk on Robert's face. Nice, Avery said as he finished. He washed his hands and left before Robert could say anything. He caught up with Lydia and his father as they were talking to someone. I have to go, he said. Something has come up and I need to deal with it. Lydia turned to kiss him, but he left before she could say or do anything. He didn't look back. At that point, he didn't care. After his shift ended, he went to a bar and nursed a couple beers before heading home. Why did she do it? He asked himself. Lydia was home by the time he got there and she was pissed. Where were you? She asked. I finished my shift and went for a couple beers, he said. What do you care, anyway? I care, she said. You're my husband and I love you. How much did Robert's Rolex cost you? He asked. Lydia's eyes grew wide. You saw that? She asked. Yeah, I saw it. And I saw what you had inscribed. Your two girls? Seriously? Is Jenny his daughter? Tell me, wife he said. He's her uncle and my brother-in-law, she said. That's all. Really? Avery asked. Please don't insult my intelligence. I saw the looks everyone at your office gave me. I'm not stupid. It's not what you think, she said. Yeah, right. Sorry, I don't believe you, he said. Look, you've been asking what I want for Christmas. Right now, all I want is your signature. My signature? She asked. On what? On the divorce papers, he said. Divorce? She asked. I don't want a divorce. I love you. You're my husband. Sure you do, he said. When you spread your legs for another man, that's exactly what you're saying. I know a lot more than you may think, so don't lie to me. I just want to know two things. What? She asked. Why and how long, he said. Lydia's eyes fell on the floor. It's been going on since a few months after I started with the firm, she said. You mean, this has been going on for most of our marriage? He asked. She nodded her head. I'm sorry, she said. I didn't want to hurt you. It was only sex and Robert said you got off on it. Didn't you remember anything I told you about Robert? Avery asked. Did I ever give you any indication that I would enjoy being cuck? I'm sorry, she said. He was just so slick and charming. I did everything I could to keep you from finding out. When did my father get in on the action? he asked. Lydia's eyes grew wide. How did you know? 
she asked. It doesn't matter how. How long have you been screwing my father? He asked. That started about a year ago, she said. We were all very careful. We really didn't want to hurt you. Am I Jenny's father? He asked. Of course you are, she said. You'll forgive me if I don't believe you, Avery responded. I'll have DNA tests done to find out for sure. How dare you? She began before Avery exploded. No, bitch, he said. How dare you? You know how much I hated that scum sucker, but you just had to go and screw him anyway. And my father. No, all of this is on you. And yes, I'm filing for divorce. All these years, I've loved you and you alone. I'm the one who took care of you when you were sick and I'm the one who took care of Jenny because you were too busy. You were my life and you stabbed me in the back. Now, leave me alone. I'll try not to screw up the holiday for Jenny, but you and a fair partner better not screw with me. He grabbed a few things and set up house in his office. He avoided his wife as much as he could and said nothing to her. He spent as much time as he could with his daughter, knowing that soon, he would become a part-time father. Ben contacted him later, telling him he had some new video. Looks like you really stirred up a hornet's nest, Ben said as Avery walked in the office. Ben started the latest video as Avery sat down. The video came from his father's office. As usual, the three lovers were naked, engaging in their usual activity. He knows, Lydia said. Robert and Dan shrugged their shoulders. So what, Robert said. Doesn't change anything. He's filed for divorce, Lydia said. Have you been served yet? Dan asked. Lydia shook her head. Not yet, but I expect it'll happen soon, she said. Well, I guess we'll just have to educate your husband, let him know the deal. He can either go along or get royally screwed, Dan said. Just be careful, Lydia said. Don't worry. He's just a stupid cop. He can't do anything to us. Avery sat quiet as the video ended. Be very careful, Ben said. I've already forwarded this to Sally, and I've spoken with your supervisor. He tells me he'll have patrols out keeping an eye on things. Ben handed him a key to an apartment he had arranged for Avery to stay at for a while. Avery thanked him before heading out. On Christmas morning, Lydia asked if he was going to his parents' house. Yeah, I'll be there, he said. She bent down to kiss him, but he waved her off. Save it for your lovers, he said. Please don't screw up Christmas, she said as she walked out with Jenny. You mean any more than you've already screwed it up? He asked. Go on, get out of here. I'll be along shortly. After he saw Lydia leave, he put his uniform on, making sure he had his body armor. He already had most of his clothes and personal items packed and in his car. He called the process server to verify the time he would be at the Wilson residence and arranged to meet him there then called his shift supervisor to have a patrol car standing by. He timed his arrival carefully and met the process server a block away. The man got into his car and he pulled up in front of the house. They got out and Avery rang the bell. Avery's father answered the door and looked shocked when he saw his son and another man. What's the meaning of this, Avery? He asked. You don't need to ring the bell. We've all been wondering when you were going to get here. Please, Mr. Wilson. Avery said in his best cop voice, his hand on his sidearm. I'm here on official business. Is Lydia Wilson here? Yes, she is, you know that. Please come in, Dan said. Avery shook his head. Not today, Mr. Wilson. Have Mrs. Wilson come to the door, please, Avery said. Dan nodded his head and motioned for Lydia, who showed up with Jenny. The process server addressed her. Mrs. Lydia Wilson? He asked. She nodded her head as he verified her identity and handed her the envelope. You've been served. Lydia began crying as she opened the envelope. You're serving me with divorce papers on Christmas? She asked, tears streaming down her cheeks. How could you? That's a lot better than what you and my former family had planned for me, I think, Avery said. Jenny started crying as she watched her mother and looked up at her father. He knelt down and hugged his daughter. What's going on, Daddy? she asked. I'm sorry, sweetheart, but your mother has decided she doesn't love me anymore, he said, holding her as she cried. I'll see you as soon as I can, and never forget that I love you, okay? Jenny, crying, turned to her mother and kicked her in the shins. I hate you, she cried as she ran away. Dan pushed his way beside a wailing Lydia. How dare you come here and disrupt our family Christmas, he bellowed. Mr. Wilson, 
Consider yourself fortunate that I'm not going to arrest you and the rest of your family for conspiracy, Avery said, handing him another envelope that contained pictures and video from their trysts at the Marriott. He was very careful not to include anything that was recorded in their offices. By now, Barbara and Robert had come to the door. What's going on? Barbara asked. Avery just served Lydia with divorce papers, Dan said. He knows. Barbara stepped back, her face turning white. Yes, and I know all about what the four of you had planned for me, Avery said. I suggest you look very carefully at the protection order and follow it to the letter. I will have no problem arresting you if you violate it. Protection order? Robert shouted. Why, I ought to kick your bum right now, he added, reaching out to Avery. Dan intercepted him as Avery prepared to pull his sidearm. Don't touch him, stupid, Dan yelled. Robert pulled his hand back. Dan looked at Avery. Okay, a-hole, if that's the way you want to play it. You could have been part of something great, but you blew it, he said. I thought I was part of something great, Avery said. He looked at Lydia. I'll call you after the first and schedule a time when I can get the rest of my things. In the meantime, I suggest you obey the order and stay away from me. Okay, Avery, she said. I am sorry. Yeah, Avery said. Goodbye. Merry Christmas. Avery went to the apartment Ben had set up for him and unpacked. Merry Christmas, indeed. He spent the rest of the day drowning his sorrows in a bottle of Jack Daniels. The next week, he received a call from his father. I want to see you in my office this afternoon, Dan ordered. Avery laughed. People in hell want ice water, too. Ain't gonna happen. Have you forgotten about the order of protection? If you want to meet, you can call my attorney and arrange a meeting at her office with her present. He ended the call before Dan could say anything else and contacted Sally. She wasn't thrilled that he called during her holiday time off, but listened to what Avery said and agreed to meet with Dan, Robert, and Lydia in her office. She also agreed to contact Dan and set it up. That afternoon, the five of them met in a conference room at Sally's office. Couldn't this have waited until after the new year? Sally asked. No, it couldn't, Dan said. Are you Mrs. Wilson's attorney? Sally asked. Dan looked at Robert. Robert Wilson and I are both her attorneys, he said. I guess you really don't care about things like conflict of interest, do you? Sally asked. Well, we'll see what the State Bar has to say about that. What's so important that you just had to meet with my client during the holiday? Dan pulled a folder out of his briefcase and set it on the table. I want Avery to call off this stupid divorce and sign this agreement, he said. Sally read the paper inside and laughed. She handed the paper to Avery, who also read it, not believing what he was seeing. You honestly expect my client to sign away his rights as a husband and to agree to let his wife have sex with you and his brother? Mr. Wilson, you're out of your mind, and rest assured I am going to take this before the state bar. Now get out of my office before I have you thrown out, she said. I'm going to destroy you, Dan told Avery. When I'm finished with you, you'll wish to God you'd never been born. You do know it's a violation of the law to communicate a threat against a police officer, Sally said. Get out before I have you all arrested. Red-faced, Dan, Lydia, and Robert left the office. Avery apologized to Sally and thanked her profusely. I can't wait to get that a-hole in front of a judge, she said as she locked up her office. Avery kept his word and called Lydia after the new year to schedule a time, so he could pick up the rest of his things. She told him that no one would be at the house, and he naively believed her. As soon as he entered the house, he felt a prick on his neck before everything went dark. He was still pretty groggy when he realized that he was tied up to a chair. He tried to move but couldn't and realized that tape had been placed over his mouth. He struggled, but wasn't able to free himself. He heard someone say something about taking his life before he saw the brilliant flash of light. That was the last thing he remembered before waking up in the hospital. John's rehab had gone better than anyone could have imagined. Not only had he regained his memory, but his body had recovered quite well, and he now felt as strong as he ever had. He noticed that the doctors had done some reconstructive surgery on his face, apparently in an effort to deal with the scars from the shooting. It wasn't much, and it left some small scars, but it was enough to make him look considerably different than before. Ben had also provided him with special contacts intended to disguise the color of his eyes. According to Ben, 
his daughter had a habit of visiting his gravesite at least once a week, usually on Tuesday mornings on her way to school. John wanted to see Jenny up close and personal, and they decided it would be best if he could disguise his eye color when they finally met. They also had agreed on a plan of revenge, which would be set in motion when John was released from rehab. Fortunately, today was the day. Ben arrived at the rehab center as John was getting his final instructions. He gathered his belongings and went to his friend's car. On the way to the apartment Ben had set up for him, they discussed their plan of action and agreed not to start until John had a chance to meet Jenny. Once at the complex, Ben helped his friend carry his belongings upstairs. John looked around at the one-bedroom apartment. He was impressed with the furniture Ben had picked out for him and was especially impressed with the very large flat-screen television mounted on the wall. After showing him around, Ben handed him the keys to the apartment, the keys to a brand new SUV, and his new bank cards. John had reintroduced himself to the latest technology while in rehab and learned how to use a smartphone and the latest Windows operating system and was able to start using the new computer Ben had set up in the front room. After thanking his friend, John settled in for the rest of the day. He took the SUV out for a spin later just to get the feel of driving. He knew that he would have to get used to driving in Southern California again, and he wasn't looking forward to that at all. He stopped at a liquor store and picked up a bottle of Jack Daniels and a pack of cigarettes. He hadn't smoked since he joined the police force, but he felt the old urge and figured that since he was already technically dead, it didn't matter anymore. He got back home and rested for the day, watching some television. After relaxing with a glass of JD and a cigarette, he went to bed for the night. He woke up early the next day, showered, dressed and headed out for the cemetery, hoping to get there before Jenny. He found the grave marker and took a seat to wait, nursing the cup of coffee he bought on the way. Soon, he spotted her walking down the path. He put his nearly empty cup in the trash bin and got up. She stopped at the grave and seemed to be saying something when he stepped up next to her. She looked at him before speaking. Did you know my father? She asked. He nodded his head before speaking. Yes, as a matter of fact, I did. We were in the army together, John said. He extended his hand. Smith. John Smith, he said. Jenny took his hand and looked at him carefully. Jenny Wilson. Good to meet you, Mr. Smith. John Smith. He smiled. Please call me John, he said. She smiled before turning back to the grave marker. He was a hero, you know, she said. Served on the police force also. Tears came to her eyes as she spoke. You really miss your father, don't you? He asked. She nodded her head. I haven't seen him since I was eight years old, she said. I miss him so much. I like to come here early in the morning and say hello. My mother would kill me if she knew. Really? John asked. Yeah, she said. She married my uncle after my dad was killed. My dad had just filed for divorce. He was killed shortly afterward. Do you know how it happened? John asked. Supposedly, he was shot by a burglar, she said. I take it you don't believe that, John said. She shook her head. My dad was the best cop there was. I don't believe he was caught by surprise, she said. I can't prove otherwise, though. What do you think happened? John asked. I don't know, she said. I just can't believe a burglar caught him by surprise. John nodded his head. It happens, you know, he said. Yeah, but not to my dad, Jenny said. So, if you don't mind my asking, have you decided what you want to do with your life? John asked. I don't mind, John, she said. I plan on going to UCLA this fall. I want to be a lawyer, but not like my mother or my uncle. I want to be a prosecutor. I want to put bad guys away. I think I owe it to my dad. Your dad would be very proud of you, John said, tears coming to his eyes. He wanted so much to wrap his arms around this girl and tell her it was going to be okay and that he was proud of her. She looked at him for a while before speaking. I have to get going now, John. Would you mind if we stayed in touch? I don't know why, but I feel safe with you, even though we just met. Something about you reminds me of my dad, she said. John smiled. Sure, Jenny. May I give you my number? Please feel free to call me anytime you need to. Sure, she said, smiling. I hope you don't mind if I call at odd hours. He shook his head. Not at all, Jenny. Call me anytime you want. They exchanged numbers and Jenny left. He headed for his SUV and didn't see Jenny put his discarded coffee cup in a plastic bag. 
He also didn't see her write down the number on his license plate. John left the cemetery and headed for Griffith Park Observatory. It was time to put the plan in motion. Once he got there, he looked out over the city, a place where he once served as a police officer. He pulled out two of the burner phones Ben had purchased. He activated the first one, set the number to private, and connected the voice changer device Ben gave him. He selected the effect he wanted, then dialed a number. A woman answered on the second ring. He recognized the voice as belonging to Lydia. Lydia Wilson, she said abruptly. Why? Why did you kill me? He asked before hanging up. He quickly turned the phone off and removed the battery. Unknown to him, Lydia had just left a meeting with some of her husband's backers when the call came in. She heard the message and tried to respond, but the call had already ended. She thought it sounded like her deceased husband, Avery, but she couldn't be sure. Surely Avery wasn't calling her from the grave, she said to herself. She thought about returning the call until she realized the incoming number was set to private. She knew her current husband had enemies and wondered if the call came from one of them. John, meanwhile, had activated the second phone. This time, he used it to send a text message to Robert's phone with an attached picture. The caption read, Remember my promise? And the photo was one recently taken of Robert, just outside his office with a set of crosshairs over his groin. After he confirmed the message was sent, he turned off the phone and removed the battery. Both phones were later smashed, with the pieces dropped in various trash bins around the area. Robert, of course, saw the photo and read the caption. He knew it referred to the promise Avery had made to him on his wedding day so long ago. But this was impossible, he thought. Avery had been dead for ten years and no one, not even Lydia, knew what his younger brother had told him. Things were tense in the Wilson household that night. Robert and Lydia shared their experience with each other, but chalked it up to a political enemy and thought no more about it. John followed the plan he and Ben had agreed to and waited three days before making his second round of calls. This time, he traveled to nearby Orange County before sent a screenshot of the video showing Robert shooting him to Lydia. The message caption simply read, Your sins will find you out? The call to Robert's phone was also different. This time, he whispered, Remember, I can blow your balls off from 1,000 yards away, before hanging up. As before, he destroyed both phones and deposited the pieces in various trash bins before heading back home. Both Robert and Lydia were getting very nervous by now. No one but them and Avery knew of the events in that bedroom 10 years ago, and Avery was dead. How could this be happening? They asked each other. Following the plan John and Ben laid out, no more calls or text messages were sent out for a couple days. John knew that Ben was busy getting information on Robert, so he spent his free time catching up with the events of the last 10 years. Then he received a call. Opening his smartphone, he noticed that it was from Jenny. John Smith, he answered. Hi, John. This is Jenny. Remember me? He smiled. He could never forget his little girl. Sure, he said. What can I do for you? Can we meet tomorrow morning at my dad's grave? About 6 a.m.? She asked. Of course, I'll be there. Is everything all right? I need to talk to someone, really bad, she said. Okay, I'll see you there in the morning, he told her. Thanks, she said before hanging up. He wondered what it was she needed to talk to him about. The next day, he sat at the bench near the gravesite and waited for Jenny. She arrived right on time and sat next to him. Good morning, he said. She returned the greeting. He could tell she was very nervous about something. Penny for your thoughts, he said. She looked at the grave then back at him. She opened her purse, pulled out an envelope and handed it to him. What's this? He asked. You know, I remember the last time I ever saw my dad alive, she said. After the funeral, my mother married my uncle Robert and he insisted I call him dad. I refused, even though it made my mother mad. He kept telling me that he was my father, but I didn't believe him. Now I have the truth. He's not my real dad. She looked at his face. You are. John was shocked. How could she know? He wondered. She pointed to the envelope. I'm sorry for the intrusion, but after we met, I grabbed your coffee cup and your cigarette, but from the trash. You know those things will kill you, she said. He laughed. Something about you reminded me of that day ten years ago. You know. You can wear contacts to change the color of your eyes, get facial surgery, change your hair color, 
even mess up your fingerprints. But you can't change your DNA. They were able to get enough saliva off what I found that they were able to identify you as my father with 99.9% .9 certainty. Wow, John said. Ben was right about you. You were resourceful. You're going to make a hell of a prosecuting attorney someday. Jenny smiled. So, who are you? Really? And who's buried in my father's grave if it isn't you? She asked. The man you knew as Avery Wilson died ten years ago, he said. My name really is John Smith. You can thank the feds for that. The official story is that Avery was killed during a home invasion. But that's not the truth, is it? She asked. He shook his head. No, he said. Not even close. I knew it. I want the truth, Dad, she said. You owe me that. He loved hearing her call him Dad. And he knew she was right. But he wasn't sure she could handle the whole truth. Are you really sure about that? He asked. It's a lot worse than you can imagine. He saw tears in her eyes. Yes, I need to know, she said. No matter how bad. Things aren't going well at the Wilson household. I take it, John said. Jenny shook her head. No, she said. Mom and Robert have been on edge the last few days. From what I gather, they've been getting strange calls and text messages, and it's really got them upset. But there's more, isn't there? John asked. Tears flowed down her cheeks even though she tried to keep from crying. Have they hurt you? She broke down crying and John wrapped his arms around her. It felt so good to hold his girl again, and he wanted to ease her pain. You'll probably hate me if I tell you, she said. John shook his head. I could never hate you. You're my little princess and always will be. She loved hearing him say that and composed herself as best she could before continuing. Robert has been molesting me, she said quietly. John felt rage as she spoke. How long has it been going on? He asked. Since I was about 13, she said. The scumsucker, John thought. Have you called 911? He asked. She nodded. A couple of times. They sent someone out and examined me, but mom said it wasn't true. Afterward, they beat me and locked me in my room. They threatened to hurt me real bad if I said anything to anyone else. What's on your schedule for today? John asked. Nothing, really. School is out, but I can't stand to be around the house anymore, she said. These days, I'm just waiting to graduate so I can move out and go to college. You said you wanted to see proof. How would you like to come to my place so I can show you? He asked. Her eyes lit up. Really? She asked. Yes, I'd like that a lot. John pulled out his phone and called Ben. Hi, John. What's up? He asked. Ben, I need to see you at my place right now. There's been a change of plan, John said. Ben knew better than to press his friend. Okay, I'll be right over. John ended the call and walked Jenny to her car. Follow me, he told her. I'm in that SUV over there, he added, pointing to his car. He drove to his apartment, making sure Jenny was behind him the whole time. He escorted Jenny to his apartment and ushered her inside. It's not as nice as your place, but it's home, he said. It's perfect, Dad, Jenny said, looking around. It could use a woman's touch, though. She accepted his offer of coffee, so he turned on his Keurig and let her choose the flavor she wanted. After getting their coffee, they sat down at his table. So, where's this evidence? She asked. Are you really sure you want to see this? He asked. It's pretty graphic. I told you. I need to see this, she said. John opened his laptop and pulled up the video showing Dan, Robert, and Lydia planning to shoot him, followed by the actual shooting video. Her face turned white and tears flowed down her cheeks. Oh my God, she said when the videos ended. I can't believe they actually plotted to murder you. By then, Ben knocked on the door. John let him in and introduced him to Jenny. So, what's going on? Ben asked after he sat down. Jenny knows who I am, John said, and she tells me that Robert has been molesting her for years. I can't just sit here and let that go on. Ben nodded his head. I understand, he said. So you think it's time to ramp things up? I do, John said. Ben thought for a minute before speaking. He looked at Jenny before speaking. Would you be willing to help us? He asked. Oh, yes, anything I can do to help, she said. Ben looked at John. We can use a set of eyes and ears in the Wilson house, he said. Maybe she can set up some cameras and give us eyes in her house. I don't want her in any danger, John said. No, she won't be. 
Would you be willing to do that, Jenny? John asked. Jenny nodded her head. Absolutely, she said. I'm over 18 now, and I want to help. And there's not a damn thing you can do to stop me, Dad, she added, putting emphasis on the dad. Besides, she added, I've been taking self-defense classes for the past several months, and I told Robert if he ever touched me again, I'd kick his balls up into his throat. He hasn't touched me since. John felt pride in his heart at his daughter's words. She was definitely his girl. All right, Ben said. I'll get you set up with the equipment and show you how to use it. He looked at John. Maybe it's time to reach out to the media. I'll arrange an interview and get back in touch. Is there anyone we can trust at the DA's office? John asked. Ben shook his head. Things have changed a lot in the last 10 years, John, Ben said. As much as I'd like to see all three of them hang, the fact is, they'll drag it out in the courts for years and there's no guarantee anything will ever be done. I'm sorry, that's just the way it is now. Then it's up to us, John said. Maybe we can get the folks back east involved, Ben said. You know, they really don't care too much for publicity. John knew what that meant. He hated the idea but realized it may be their best hope. Okay, arrange the interview. I'll keep doing what I've been doing. Maybe we can force their hand. He looked at Jenny. You set those cameras up like Ben said and don't take any chances. If you feel you're in any danger at all, you call me and Ben, immediately. If need be, you can stay here. Any questions? Ben and Jenny shook their heads. All right, let's roll. They headed out, with John giving his daughter a hug. I'm so proud of you, Jenny, he said, tears threatening to run down his cheek. Jenny smiled and kissed her father on the cheek. I love you, Dad, she said. I love you too, princess, he answered. The next few days went by like a blur. John continued his campaign of calls and messages, pushing Lydia and Robert even further over the brink. Jenny followed the directions Ben gave her and had cameras and microphones set up all over the house. Even the house phones were wired. Robert and Lydia couldn't use the bathroom without Ben and John knowing about it. As a result, John, Ben and Jenny collected even more evidence against Robert and Lydia, including phone calls with the suspicious, shadowy figures who were propping up Robert's campaign. Ben collected and analyzed all the video and phone calls, sorting out the daily fluff from the important stuff. Ben also met with a reporter he knew and trusted at the Los Angeles Times, and she reached out to John. John Smith, he said, when his phone rang. Mr. Smith, this is Elizabeth Johnson from the Times. I spoke with a friend of yours, and he says you have a story for me. Can we speak sometime soon? Sure. I also have some video to show you if you're interested. Yes, I'm very interested, she said. Can you come by this afternoon? Yes, I can be there this afternoon. What time? John asked. They agreed to meet at a conference room at the paper's office at 2 p.m. that afternoon before ending the call. John looked at his watch. He had a little more than an hour to get there, so he grabbed his things and headed out. He finally found a place to park and made his way to the conference room, where he met Elizabeth. She looked to be about his age, with short blonde hair. She looked good, even in her professional attire. John, naturally, looked at her fingers and saw no wedding or engagement rings. He reached out to her. Miss Johnson? He asked. She smiled and took his hand. Please call me Liz, she said. Come in and have a seat. Can I get you something? Coffee? Yeah. Latte? Coffee is always welcome, he said with a smile. Liz pressed a button on the intercom and ordered two cups of coffee to be delivered. Ben Jacobs tells me you have a story about Robert Wilson and from what he tells me, it sounds quite interesting, she said. John nodded his head. Liz, how much do you know about the shooting death of his brother, Avery? John asked. As I recall, the official report is that he was killed during a home invasion, she said. Are you saying that's not accurate? Let me show you a couple videos and I'll let you decide. Then I'll tell you my story if you're still interested. And I have to warn you, these videos are quite graphic, John said. Is that okay? Sure she said as John booted up his laptop. He navigated to the folder and showed her the video of Robert, Dan, and Lydia plotting to murder him, then showed her the video of the shooting itself. After they ended, Liz sat in her chair, shocked. Well, what do you think? John asked, are you interested? Absolutely, I'm interested, she said. How did you get these videos? 
I'll explain, but first I want to know, how much of this is on the record? John asked. If there's something you want kept off the record, just tell me, she said. John thought for a moment. Okay, Liz, John said. Ben says he trusts you, and that's good enough for me. This part is definitely off the record. Officially, Avery Wilson died 10 years ago. John Smith, me, spent 10 years in a coma as a result of that shooting. I was Avery Wilson. The feds arranged the new identity and would have put Avery in protective custody. For whatever reason, their case went cold and nothing came of it. But Avery remains dead as far as the world is concerned. Are you with me so far? Yes, Liz said. You know, I'm going to have to vet this before anything is published. I'll definitely have to get these videos analyzed. I understand, John said. If you check your public records, you'll see that Avery, that is, me, filed for divorce in December 2008, and the papers were served on Christmas. The shooting happened shortly after the first of the year. You should also find an agreement proposed by Robert and his father, who were acting as Lydia's attorneys. He went on to tell Liz his story, stopping only when he came to a part he wanted kept off the record. Let me show you one more thing, John said, pulling out the DNA test Jenny had done on him. He showed it to Liz, who understood what the paper said. Oh my God, she said. You really are Avery Wilson. Or were Avery Wilson. Look, there's a lot more to this story. Would you be open to discussing it over dinner? John asked. Liz smiled. Maybe, she said. Let me think about it for a while and I'll call, okay? Sounds good, Liz, he said. I look forward to hearing from you. They said their goodbyes and John left for home. The next day, he got a call from Liz. Mr. Smith, I hope this isn't too short a notice, but I'd like to take you up on that offer of dinner. Sure, John said. Where would you like to go? Well, there's a political meet and greet with some of the candidates, including Robert, she said. I'm even going to get a chance to ask some questions. Are you still interested? Sounds interesting, John said. Sure, give me the details and I'll pick you up. After Liz gave him the information he needed, he called Ben to let him know. Are you nuts? Ben asked. It'll be fine, John said. I'm dead, remember? You just be careful and let Liz ask the questions, got me? Ben asked. Yeah, got it, John said. John called his daughter to give her a heads up that he would be there with Liz. Thanks for letting me know, she said. I'll be there as well, of course so I'll act like we've never met. Thanks, John said. Later, he put on his best suit and picked Liz up at her apartment. She looked ravishing in her evening gown. You look gorgeous, he said when she opened the door. She smiled. Thank you, sir, and you look rather dapper yourself. They arrived at the event and mingled with the line heading into the dinner. Liz handed her invitation, which included her, plus one, to the doorman, who waved them in. Robert, Lydia and Jenny were close to the door, shaking hands with everyone who came in. John held his breath, hoping that neither Lydia nor Robert would recognize him. Robert reached out to Liz as she came up to him. Good evening, Ms. Johnson, he said as he took her hand. So good to see you. And I see you brought a friend, he added. Reaching out to John, John thought he would lose it, but took a breath and shook Robert's hand. And you are? he asked. Smith. John Smith. John told him. He glanced down and noticed that Robert was wearing the Rolex watch Lydia had given him that fateful Christmas. Good to meet you, Mr. Smith. This is my wife, Lydia, and my daughter Jenny, he added. John nodded to Lydia and Jenny. Jenny smiled politely and Lydia looked at him strangely. She didn't look too good, John thought. Wrinkles were forming around her eyes and mouth and she looked tired and thin, too thin, he thought. John thought that maybe she recognized him, but shrugged the thought off. Mrs. Wilson, Miss Wilson, he said perfunctorily before moving on. John and Liz made their way to the place reserved for them and sat down, introducing themselves to the others at the table. He leaned into Liz. That watch he's wearing is the one Lydia gave him ten years ago, he whispered. Oh, really? she asked. Interesting. The dinner went well, or as well as a rubber chicken political dinner can go. John choked down his food and engaged in light conversation with others at the table. He glanced at Robert periodically and saw Jenny checking him out. He wasn't sure, but he thought he saw her give him a thumbs up. He smiled and turned back to his dinner. Finally, 
The dinner portion of the event was over, and the MC introduced the candidates at the dais. Robert was the first candidate to address the crowd. After giving his standard stump speech about bringing accountability back to Sacramento, the floor was opened for journalists to ask questions. Liz had her hand up and was picked first. She stood and introduced herself. Elizabeth Johnson, Los Angeles Times, she said. This is your first time on the political scene, and we don't know that much about you, Mr. Wilson. Can you tell us how close you were to your brother, Officer Avery Wilson? Thank you for asking, Ms. Johnson, he said. My brother and I were very close. Always had been. His death hit us all very hard. I see, Liz said. And you married your brother's widow shortly after his funeral ten years ago, right? That's correct, he said. So, can you please explain to us why your brother named both you and your father in his divorce from his wife, which, by the way, was filed less than a month before his shooting? Liz asked. Audible gasps were heard throughout the venue. That was ten years ago, Ms. Johnson, Robert said. My brother suffered from a form of paranoia, perhaps as a result of his military service. I don't know why he would have done that. But the divorce paperwork showed a proposal put forth by both you and your father that would have stripped Officer Wilson of his rights as a husband, Liz said. Can you please explain that? And is it normal for two senior members of a law firm to take on a basic divorce like this? I don't recall such a proposal, Robert said, nervously. As for representing Lydia, we did it as a benefit to her for her years of loyal service to us. He looked around the room. Next, he called out before Liz could ask another question. He pointed to a man two tables over from Liz. Brad Williams, Orange County Register, he said. Can you please answer Ms. Johnson's question? Were you having an affair with your brother's wife at the time of the shooting? More gasps were heard in the room. John saw Lydia look down at her plate when the question was asked. That's an outrageous accusation, Robert said. I thought the world of my brother. I loved him. No one was more sad to hear of his death than I. At the time of the shooting, your firm was under investigation by federal authorities for allegations of ties with organized crime. Can you please tell us what happened to that investigation? Brad asked. We were cleared of all allegations and the case was closed, Robert said. Next. He pointed to another woman a few tables away. Jane Holiday, KDTV News, she said. As I recall, the FBI never fully closed the case. They just said they couldn't find any conclusive evidence to back up the claims. Isn't that correct? The result was the same as far as we're concerned, Robert said. If there was anything to the charges, my father would never have been selected for his seat on the court. John could see that Robert was clearly nervous. The MC got up and ended the question and answer session before introducing the next candidate. I don't think he did himself any favors, John whispered to Liz. She smiled and nodded her head. I think you're right, she said. You might want to check the evening news when you get home tonight. A couple hours later, the event ended and everyone got up to leave. Robert, Lydia, and Jenny made a beeline for the door, but were intercepted by John and Liz. Mr. Wilson, John said extending his hand. Robert stopped and shook his hand. I couldn't help but notice your watch. That's a mighty nice piece. May I have a look, please? Robert took it off and handed it to him. John examined it and turned it over, showing Liz the inscription on the back, which was just as he had described it to her the previous day. He handed it back to Robert. I knew someone who had a watch very much like that, John said. He looked at Lydia. You must love your husband a great deal to give something like that. Lydia smiled. Yes, I do. Mr. Uh? She began. Smith, John said. Good to meet you folks. Please, have a pleasant evening. He nodded to Jenny, who was smiling. Robert put his arm around Lydia, and the three of them left quickly. John and Liz watched them leave. I think you just got your story, John, Liz said. John nodded as he turned to Liz. I think so, he said picking up Liz's sweater. Now that this is over, would you care to go somewhere nice? Maybe have a real dinner? She smiled. I'd love to, John, but I have to get home and get this story filed so it can get in the morning paper, she said. I understand, John said. Liz turned to John as he pulled up in front of her apartment complex. John, I want you to know that I looked at your old police record. I wasn't trying to pry, but I had to know what kind of man you are, or were. According to your record, 
You were a no-nonsense cop who took no guff from anyone, she said. But what I saw tonight was something different, she said. I was very impressed with the restraint you showed. It couldn't have been easy seeing your wife and daughter with the man who shot you. No, it wasn't, John said. I am hoping to build a relationship with my daughter, though. Liz nodded. I understand. She's quite beautiful and looks a lot like you. Listen, if you don't mind, I'd like to make this up to you. How do you like country and western? She asked. I love it, John said. Good, she said, smiling. I know just the place you can take me a week from this Friday if you're up to it. They serve cold beer and the best burgers in town. And they have line dancing. You do have a pair of jeans and cowboy boots, right? I think I can scare some up by then, he said. If you don't mind teaching me this line dancing thing. I've been asleep the last ten years, you know? Pick me up at, say, 6.30, she asked. John smiled. It's a date, he said. He got out of the car, opened the door for Liz, and walked her to her apartment. She opened the door, then turned and gave him a light kiss on the cheek. I'll see you a week from Friday, cowboy, she said before going inside. Sleep tight. As she closed the door, John felt like a schoolboy who just got his first date. He practically skipped and jumped as he headed back to his car, a smile on his face. He drove home and immediately turned on the evening news. It took a while, but the local news networks played excerpts of the night's event. Tonight, several candidates for state office held a meet and greet with members of the press to introduce themselves, the news announcer said. Attorney Robert Wilson was grilled over his relationship with his brother, slain police officer Avery Wilson, and the officer's widow, who is now his wife. Video showed a very nervous and agitated Robert deflecting questions being thrown at him. John smiled. This was not a good night for Robert at all. At one point, Wilson was confronted with an allegation that he may have been having an affair with his brother's wife, who was served with divorce papers less than a month before the tragic shooting, the announcer added. Wilson denied the charge, saying he loved his brother. His phone rang when the report ended. Picking up his phone, he noticed the call was from Jenny. Hey, princess, he said when he answered the phone. Hi, dad, she said. Who was the hottie you were with tonight? Her name is Liz. She's a reporter. I take it you approve? John asked. Absolutely, Jenny said. Well, I have a real date with her a week from this Friday, John said. Good for you. By the way, mom and Robert are about to explode. They're beyond pissed over the questions he got asked. They've been on the phone with reporters ever since they got home. I don't know what you did, but you sure got under his skin. John laughed. Yeah, he didn't look like he was having a good time, John said. I'm just glad I was able to get so close to them without being recognized. How are you holding up? I'm doing okay, Jenny said. Look, I have to go now. I have school tomorrow, but I'll be in touch. Love you. Love you too, princess, he said. Be careful. They ended the call, but John's phone rang again. This time, it was Ben. Hey, buddy, Ben said. Saw Robert on the evening news. He didn't look very good up there at all. Liz really got him on the defensive. Yes, she did, John said. I think your idea about going to the media was a good one. Any news on your end? We have some interesting video from their house and we've captured several calls from reporters, Ben said. There was another call from your father and he wasn't happy at all with the way Robert handled things. I'm not surprised, John said. Jenny tells me they're beyond pissed. Well, I've got a couple things developing here so I'll get with you later, Ben said. I think his performance just captured the attention of his backers. If you know what I mean, John knew exactly what Ben meant, and he knew it wouldn't be good for Robert either. John spent the rest of the week doing what he had been doing, sending little notes and calls to harass Robert and Lydia all with the hopes of pushing them over the edge. He also spent some time buying new jeans and cowboy boots for his date with Liz. Jenny had some time after school one day and went with him. I think someone's gonna get lucky, she told her father as he modeled his new boots for her. He laughed. You really think Liz will go for an old fella like me? He asked her. Old? Please, Jenny said. You're in great shape and you're damn good looking. She's crazy if she doesn't fall for you. You're a great catch. I'm glad you think so, princess, he said. How are you holding up? I'm doing good, she said. Robert's left me alone ever since all this started. He and mom aren't doing too good, though. 
All they do is fight and argue. I'm thinking it's time to up our game a bit, John said. I'll talk to Ben and Liz and see what they think. Jenny nodded her head. You may be right, Dad, she said. They're awful nervous about something. I'm wondering if it's time to bring up your issues with Robert. Would you be comfortable with that? He asked. Jenny thought for a moment before answering. I'm never comfortable with it, but I know it'll have to be dealt with at some point, she said. Would you be okay if I mention it to Liz and have her talk about it with you? He asked. Yeah, I suppose, she said nervously. I trust you, Dad. Do what you think is best, okay? Just don't do anything stupid. Okay, sweetie, John said. His heart ached for her, and he wanted so bad to rip Robert's tool off and feed it to the dogs for what he did to his little girl. After Jenny left for home, he got a call from Liz. Hi, John, she said as he answered. I just wanted to let you know that our tech people have analyzed the video you gave me, and they say they're both legit. I've run it by my editor, and he's curious to see what I can come up with. Do you have more video or information you can share with me? Yes, I do, John said. Do you want to meet for lunch or something? There's another aspect of this I haven't shared with you yet, and it's very sensitive. Yeah, sure. Can we meet in about an hour? I'll text you the address. Sounds good, John said. I just need to run home and grab my laptop. All right, Liz said. I'll see you then. After getting the address, John headed home, grabbed his laptop, and went to meet Liz. She selected a nice bistro with outdoor seating, and John spotted her instantly. She smiled as he took his seat across from her. Good to see you again, he said. You too, cowboy, she said. What have you got for me? Well, the first thing is an issue with Jenny, my daughter, by the way. She knows who I am, and we've been spending some time together getting reacquainted. She's quite a remarkable girl. That's good that you're getting to know her again, Liz said. What's going on with her? She told me that Robert has been molesting her sexually since she was about 13, he said. Liz looked at him, shocked. Oh my God, has she called 911 or done anything? Yeah, she says she called 911 twice, but her mother was able to lie their way out of it, he said. According to Jenny, they threatened her if she called 911 again. We've got to get her out of there, Liz said. John nodded his head. I know we do, but she's now over 18 and almost out of high school. She'll be going to UCLA in the fall and she plans to stay there. Right now, she's biding her time at home. We've got their whole house wired for both audio and video, and we'll catch it if anything happens, but I'm torn. Part of me wants to get her out now, but if I do that, I'll end up exposing her and myself to even more danger. These people play for keeps, and they'd have no problem killing her as well as me. I have a second bedroom, Liz said. She can come stay with me if she wants to. Would you like me to talk to her? Would you mind? John asked. I think she needs to talk to another woman, someone who can see her point of view. Liz nodded. I'd love to talk to her. Would you arrange it, please? The sooner the better, Liz said. John nodded his head and pulled out his phone. How about now if I can arrange it? He asked. That would be great, she said. John called his daughter, and she picked up after the second ring. Hey, Dad. Hello, Princess. Can you meet with me and Liz like, right now? He asked. Wow, she said. Where are you at? John gave her the address. Yeah, I'm not too far from there. I just finished up my self-defense class and I can be there in about 15 minutes. Okay, we'll wait for you, John said. We're sitting outside in the back. After ending the call, he looked at Liz. She can be here in 15 minutes. Is that okay? He asked. Sure, Liz said. It'd be nice to have another woman in the place for a while. Oh, John asked. Yeah. My daughter lived with me after my divorce. My ex couldn't keep it in his pants, and I caught him one time too many. He left and she stayed. Then she got killed by a drunk driver. She was only 16 at the time. I'm sorry to hear that, John said. I didn't know you had any kids. Yeah, I did. So I know how you're feeling right now. You want to rip Robert's tool off and shove it down his throat, don't you? John nodded. I've thought about it a time or two, he said. Well. Don't do anything stupid, she told him. You have a daughter who needs her dad and I have to confess that I kinda like you, too. She smiled. What me? He asked. I'm an old man. She shook her head. Not hardly, she said. I'll bet you're not more than two or three years older than me. 
No way I am 47. You can't be more than, what, 35? She smiled. Thanks for the compliment. I'm actually 44, but don't tell anyone, okay? Your secret is safe with me, he told her. Just remember, John Smith, you may be able to rip Robert's head off, and God knows you have every right to, but there's an old saying about not arguing with someone who buys their ink by the barrel, she said. Do what you must, but don't cross the line. Thanks for the reminder, he said. By the way, did you remember to bring more video? She asked. Yes, I did, pulling up his laptop. This is all pretty graphic stuff, by the way. He copied the files to a thumb drive and handed it to her. Use what you want. She took it from him. Thanks, she said. Just then, Jenny joined them at the table. John stood and offered her a seat. He introduced the two women. I saw you at the dinner the other night, Jenny said. I love the way you nailed Robert. Thanks, Liz said. She looked at John. You want to take a stroll, Dad, so Jenny and I can talk girl talk for a bit? John held up his hands and stood. I'll let you two have at it, he said. He kissed Jenny on the cheek and looked at Liz. Thank you, he said. Give us about a half hour, okay? Liz asked. Got it. I'll be back in a half hour. John left and went window shopping for a half hour before he returned to the bistro and rejoined the two girls. They were laughing and joking like old friends. The avenging warrior returns, Liz said with a smile. Okay, Dad, here's the deal. Jenny is going to come to my place tonight and stay with me until she starts up at UCLA. She's welcome to stay as long as she wants. But there's one condition. I'll pay her way, John said. I don't expect you to support her. That wouldn't be right. Liz shook her head. Thanks, I appreciate that, but that's not what I meant. Starting tomorrow... We both expect you to come by and have dinner with us as much as possible. Preferably every night if you can, she said, and spend as much of your weekends with us as possible. Both women looked at him with smiles on their faces. Okay, he said. That's actually two conditions, but I accept. It's a deal. Jenny wrapped her arms around John as Liz smiled. Thank you, Daddy, she said. I love you so much. I love you too, princess, John said tears threatening to roll down his face. As she sat back down, Liz held out her hand. Let me see your phone for a bit, Jenny, she said. I want to make sure any tracking they have set up is disabled. Jenny handed Liz her phone, and John watched as the older woman's fingers flew over the screen. Shortly, she gave the phone back to Jenny. There. I've disabled your GPS and took off the Phone Finder app. I didn't see anything else. I've also put in my phone number so you can call me if you need to she said. What are you going to tell your mother? John asked. Nothing really, Jenny said. Only that I'll be staying with a friend for a while. I'm over 18 now, so there's nothing she can do to stop me. She looked at Liz and her father and wondered what life with the two of them would be like. Thank you both so much for everything. She looked at Liz. I'll see you this evening, okay? Liz nodded her head. I'll see you, she said. You have the key I gave you, right? Got it right here. Jenny said before leaving. By now. I can't tell you how much this means to me, John said after Jenny left. Especially since we just met. Liz took his hand. My gut instincts are usually right, John, she said. And right now, my gut is telling me to trust you. You've been hurt real bad and a part of me wants to help you. And who knows what'll come of it. John nodded his head in understanding. But remember what I told you earlier. Do what you have to with Robert and Lydia but don't cross the line. I understand, he said. Liz grabbed his hand and looked at him. Hard. Promise me, she said. I promise, John told her. She nodded her head. I'm going to hold you to that. Well, I have to get going. I have to get ready for my new house guest, she said. I'll also see what I can find out about those 911 calls. If Jenny called, there's going to be a record of it. I'll let you know what I find, okay? Okay. Sounds good, Liz, John said. After Liz left, John received a call from Ben. What's up, Ben? Answering the phone. Got a few minutes? Ben asked. John answered in the affirmative. I need you to come by and check something out. There's been a very interesting phone call. I'll be right there, John said. Hanging up, he left the bistro after paying the bill and headed to Ben's office. He went straight into Ben's office when he got there. Ben looked up from his computer. John, 
I want you to hear this. Turning his laptop around, John sat down and looked at the screen. Ben had video up as well as audio from the call and had apparently been able to sync the two. The video showed Robert in his office, answering his phone. Wilson, he said. Bobby, exclaimed the man at the other end of the call. Tony, Robert said. Long time no here. How's it hanging, buddy? Bobby, Bobby, what this shit I'm reading about your campaign, huh? The man said in a distinctive New York accent. I don't know what you mean, Tony, Robert said. Some reporter from the Times hit me with some old shit out of the blue. I thought we had that issue with your brother taken care of a long time ago, Tony said. I did too, Robert said. Look, Bobby, Mario's not too pleased right now. You know how he feels about loose ends, right? You need to get this shit under control, Tony said. We've got a boatload of cash going into your campaign, and we can't afford to have you screw it up. I understand, Tony, Robert said. Maybe I should take care of that reporter from the Times. What? You planning to whack some reporter chick for doing her job? Tony asked. Are you nuts? You know everyone with a blog is writing about this. What? Are you gonna whack every blogger on the planet? What are you, stupid? Look, Tony, tell Mario I'll meet with that reporter and see if we can't get it tamped down a bit, okay? Papers are gonna write what they want. You know that, Robert said. I'll tell him, but you'd better get a handle on this shit, you understand me? Tony asked. You know how Mario believes in being thorough. You catch my drift? I'll take care of it, Tony. No problem, Robert said, clearly nervous. Make sure you do, Bobby, Tony warned. Cause the next time, there won't be any phone call. Understand? Got it, Tony. I'll take care of it, Robert said. The call ended, and Robert's face went white. He sat back and took a drink as the video ended. Ben looked at John. Well, sounds like his supporters back east aren't thrilled with him right now, John said. Robert looked like he was gonna pass out. It's worse than you know, Ben said. I think the man Tony referred to, Mario, is none other than Mario da Silva, one of, if not the, most feared crime boss in the country. I've heard that he's been trying to get people elected across the country to help him with his various projects which are just fronts for their criminal activities. Are you thinking we should maybe let them take care of Robert and Sylvia? John asked. I think that if we're careful to feed the media just enough to get them interested in Robert's activities and background, they might just take care of them for us, he said. This De Silva character is a criminal of the highest order, but he's generally thought of as a very loyal and dedicated family man. Isn't De Silva the guy the feds were looking into when I was shot? John asked. Why not hand this over to the feds? Yes, he was, personally. I don't know if the feds can find their own a-holes right now. The way they botched this up nine or ten years ago doesn't give me any confidence. I wouldn't be surprised if De Silva had someone embedded in the FBI at the time. Why don't we do a deep dive into all the old videos we have and see if there's any reference to Mario or any of his cronies? John suggested. I think you may be onto something there, Ben said. If they actually had ties to De Silva, surely they talk about it. Hell, they openly discussed murdering you. Let's get started on that, okay? Sure, John said. By the way, how's things with Liz? Ben asked. Looking good. We have a date coming up and Ginny's going to stay with her at least until she starts at y'all. A wide smile on Ben's face. Good, he said. Liz is a good woman and she'll do you right. Just don't screw it up with her. I'm curious, John said. Why didn't you go after Liz? I would, except that incest is a felony in California, Ben said. She is my sister. The guy she was married to was a cheating louse who couldn't keep his tool in his pants. She went through hell when her daughter was killed. You take good care of her. You hear me? John smiled. Count on it, my friend, he said. John left and headed home, confident that things were finally starting to turn around for him. The next day, he went to Liz's apartment for dinner, looking forward to the evening with the girls. Jenny answered the door when he knocked, wearing a pair of cutoffs and a t-shirt. Liz looked good as well, and also wore a pair of denim cutoffs. He checked out her shapely legs and felt a familiar stirring in his groin. Well, have a seat, Liz said as she dished up a nice lasagna. John's mouth watered as he smelled the food before him. Liz insisted they say grace before the meal and asked John to lead them in giving thanks, which he did. For the first time in a decade, he felt like he was at home. 
John had two helpings of lasagna, along with seconds on the green beans Liz had prepared. The girls smiled to themselves as they watched him eat. This was the first home-cooked meal he had eaten in ten years, and he savored every bite. Finally satisfied, he sat back and looked at Liz. That was the best lasagna I think I've ever had, he said. Thank you so much, Liz. You're welcome, cowboy, she said. I'm glad you enjoyed it. I think we might even have enough left for tomorrow if you're interested. I most definitely am, he said. He turned to Jenny. Have you heard from your mom or Robert? He asked. Yeah, she called me earlier and wanted to know where I would be staying. I just told her I'm staying with a friend. She wasn't too happy about it, but I told her I'm 18 and I can stay where I want. I don't think she'll be bothering me anymore. John nodded his head. Good. Any news on your end, Liz? He asked. Yes, as a matter of fact. I did some digging and was able to get the 911 calls Jenny made. I listened to them and looked up the record of the home visits. Jenny was right. Somehow, Lydia and Robert managed to convince them that nothing had happened. She looked at Jenny, who was uncomfortable with the subject. I think Jenny and I should discuss it more later this evening. Are you okay with that? She asked Jenny. Yeah, I think so, she said. Good, Liz said. And what about you? She asked, looking at John. Well, we got some interesting audio of a call between Robert and a crony of some gangster back east. We believe that Mario De Silva is the one behind Robert's campaign. And he's not too happy about the way things are going, John said. Isn't De Silva the one the FBI thought your father was involved with? Liz asked. I believe so. Ben and I are going through all the videos we have to see if we can find any mention of De Silva or anyone in his organization. I've spent a good part of the day doing that, but so haven't found anything yet. You know there's software that can do that, right? Liz asked. John shook his head. No, I didn't. Remember, I've been out of the loop for a while. Do you have something like that at the paper? He asked. Liz laughed. I have something like that right here at home, she said. I use it to transcribe audio to text all the time. It's not 100% foolproof, and I usually have to go back through the output to fix errors, but it's a lot faster than trying to type as I listen. How much are we talking about? There's probably hundreds of hours of video, I think, John said. Well, bring it over and I'll get started on it. I can help with that if it's okay, Jenny said. John and Liz agreed. Just so long as your homework gets done first, John said. Yes, Dad, smiling. Speaking of which, I have some studying to get done so if you guys don't mind, I'll get started. Okay, dear, John said. Jenny got up, kissed her father and Liz on the cheek, and headed to her room. Liz waited for her to close the door before she spoke. Your daughter is a wonderful girl, Liz said. I agree, she is. She's going to make a great attorney someday, I think, Liz added. I think you're right, he stood and helped Liz clean up the dinner table, rinsing the dishes before putting them in the dishwasher. Liz looked like she was about to start crying. Are you all right? He asked, taking her in his arms. It's just been so long since I've had a man in the house, she said. He held her as tears fell down her cheeks. It's been a long time for me as well, he said. Liz kissed him on the lips before pouring them each a glass of wine. They sat on her couch and continued talking. So, what's next? She asked. Well, your brother and I are going to keep digging to see what we can come up with. If my hunch is right, De Silva will take care of Robert for us, he said. So, you know Ben is my brother? She asked. Yes, he just informed me, John said. I suppose I should have told you earlier, but I wanted to get to know you a bit better first, Liz said. I owe your brother a debt of gratitude I'll never be able to pay, John said. He's the one who looked out for me when all this first started ten years ago. I understand, Liz said. He's helped me out a lot as well. I couldn't have made it through my divorce without him. Changing the subject, do you think De Silva might have your brother murdered? I don't know, John said. I know he's feared for a reason. At the very least, he can ruin Robert and maybe even my father. I'll do what I can, she said. My editor has given me the green light to go after Robert, but I have to be careful. I don't want it to look like a vendetta and I certainly don't want to put anything out that could open the paper up to a lawsuit. Is it possible to use the videos from 10 years ago? John asked. Maybe, we obviously can't print the video in the paper, but we can use them on the website and we can print screenshots from them. 
I would have to be very careful about how they're presented. Let me run that by my editor first. I'll do that tomorrow, but I think we should build up to it with some of the other things we have. Good. If your editor goes along with it, I think it'll put an end to Robert's career. He looked at his watch. I think I need to tell my daughter good night and head home. Thank you for the lovely dinner. Liz wrapped her arms around John and kissed him passionately. He returned the kiss, feeling his manhood begin to react. She noticed and smiled. Maybe someday you can stay and have dessert, she said. I'd like that, he said. They broke their embrace as Jenny walked into the room. Okay, you too, Jenny said. I swear, I can't take you guys anywhere. John stood and kissed Liz goodnight, then hugged his daughter. Good night, princess, he said. I'll see you tomorrow night, okay? Okay, dad, she said. Sleep tight. The next day, John continued his campaign of texts and calls to Robert and Lydia, which he knew was driving them further over the edge. He copied all the videos he had onto DVDs for Liz and Jenny, which took up most of his day. He didn't realize how many incriminating videos he had of them until he tried putting them all together in chronological order. That night at dinner, he handed the discs to Liz, who couldn't believe the volume of what he had given her. I talked to my editor today, and he wants me to pursue the infidelity angle first, and then possibly use that as a segue into the other stuff, Liz said. You've already given me plenty of evidence to back it up, and if Robert threatens to sue, we'll bury him with everything we have. Sounds good. John said. When will this happen? Read tomorrow's paper. I have a feeling the shit is going to hit the fan, she said. John smiled. I can't wait, he said. Sure enough, news of Robert and Lydia's infidelity led the news, with all of the morning shows talking about Liz's article. An article in the Los Angeles Times accuses state Senate candidate Robert Wilson of having had an affair with the wife of his brother, slain police officer Avery Wilson, the news announcer said. According to the article, video obtained by the paper shows the officer's wife engaging in sexual activity with both Robert and his father, current Superior Court Judge Daniel Wilson. Obviously, we cannot air that video here, but screen captures published by the paper show all three in an unfavorable light. Eyewitness News and other outlets were given a screening of the video, and we can confirm that it does show the three engaging in sexual activity. The article further states that divorce papers filed by Officer Wilson named both Robert and Daniel Wilson and alleges that his wife, Lydia, was involved in an adulterous relationship with the two men. We reached out to Judge Wilson, but have not received a comment as of this broadcast. Robert Wilson has previously denied any such relationship and attempts to contact Mr. or Mrs. Wilson have been unsuccessful. According to the article, the videos also included references to a crime syndicate on the East Coast. Wilson's firm was under investigation for ties to organized crime at the time of these events. Federal authorities have said they were unable to conclusively connect the firm to the mob. Officer Wilson was gunned down in his home just a few days after serving his wife with divorce papers, the announcer said. We have also been told additional information about that shooting may be forthcoming in the next few days. Stay tuned. Elated, John opened his paper. He usually didn't read the paper, but he had to read the article. There it was, in black and white, with blurred photos from the video. The article was quite lengthy and detailed as much of the affair as possible. It also discussed the mob connections and hinted that the shooting may have been planned. He was jumping for joy when his phone rang. Smith, he said, answering the phone. Did you read the article? Liz asked. Just finished it. That was great he said. I'm glad you liked it. I'm being bombarded with calls right now. Everyone wants to talk about the article, so dinner may be a bit late tonight. No problem, he said. I'll go see Jenny, and we'll fix you dinner tonight if that's okay. That's more than okay, she said. Bye, see you tonight. After he hung up, his phone rang again. But this was coming from a number marked, private. He wondered who might be calling him, and accepted the call. Smith, he said. Good morning, Mr. Smith, said a man with a heavy New York accent. John recognized it as belonging to Tony, the man Robert spoke to earlier. Who is this? John asked. What do you want? Listen carefully, Mr. Smith, the man said. There will be a black sedan pull into your apartment complex in the next few minutes. Two men will come to your door. They have been instructed to escort you to meet my boss. 
You have nothing to fear so long as you follow their instructions to the letter. Am I clear? You're clear, John said. The call ended, and John called Ben to let him know what had just happened. I don't think you're in any danger, Ben said, but just in case, turn on your phone finder app the way I showed you and I'll keep an eye on you. Call me as soon as you can. I think De Silva's people are getting ready to deal with Wilson. Do as they say, and you should be all right. John followed Ben's advice, and as soon as he had turned on the app, he saw a large black sedan pull into the apartment complex. A minute later, there was a knock on his door. He opened it to see two very large men wearing suits and sunglasses. He also noticed their sidearms sitting in shoulder holsters under their jackets. Come with us, Mr. Smith, one of them said. John nodded and followed them to the car. They put a blindfold on him before helping him into the back seat and searched him for weapons. They found his cell phone and took it from him. The door was closed, and he heard the men get into the front seat. He decided to play it cool and stay quiet as they drove. He counted the seconds in his mind, making note of the turns, hoping to get some idea of where he was going. After about 45 minutes, he felt the car stop. The men got out of the car and opened his door. One man held his upper arm as they walked away from the car. He heard a metallic door open and he was guided inside. After the door closed, the men removed his blindfold. As his eyes adjusted to the darkened room, he saw a man with a medium build approach him. The man offered his hand, so John accepted it. Mr. Smith, I'm so glad you could join us, the man said with a smile. My name is Mario De Silva. Perhaps you may have heard of me. Please, walk with me. John followed him as he went into another room. There, shackled to the wall, was Robert, Lydia, and Dan. They sat on the cold concrete floor in their underwear and looked genuinely frightened. Their feet were spread before them and chained to staples in the concrete, and their hands were chained above their heads. There's some people here I thought you'd like to see one last time, the man said. I'm sure you know Mr. and Mrs. Robert Wilson and Superior Court Judge Dan Wilson. Yes, I know them, John said. They all looked up at him their eyes begging for mercy. Avery? Robert asked weakly. Is that really you? No, John said. Avery's dead. You murdered him ten years ago. Remember? You and the 304, he added, looking at Lydia, who had tears in her eyes. In fact, all three of you plotted to murder him. I guess your chickens have finally come home to roost, haven't they? John looked at one of Mario's men and noticed he carried a taser. It had electrodes that needed to be placed on the skin to work. He looked at Mario. May I? He asked, pointing to the taser. Mario looked at him, then at the taser. He smiled and motioned for the man to hand it over. John took the taser in his hand and looked back at Robert. He noticed that Robert's boxers were open just enough to expose his genitals. He bent down and whispered in Robert's ear loud enough for everyone to hear. This is for molesting Jenny. You worthless piece of shit, he said, putting the electrodes on Robert's tool and pressing the trigger. Robert screamed as the taser burned into him, causing him to convulse in agony. John stood up and looked down at Robert. And this is for your brother's wife, he said before kicking Robert as hard as he could in the groin, causing him to scream again. He bent down and addressed Robert. I just want to know one thing, he told Robert. Why? Robert looked at him for a minute before answering. Because. It was fun, he said weakly. John stood up and looked at Robert for a moment. Then he kicked Robert in the groin again. And again. You know you're right, John said. This is fun. He kicked Robert in the groin one more time. Are you having big fun now, a hole? Huh. He looked down at Lydia and shook his head. I was always taught never to hit a woman, he said. Avery loved you with all his heart. And how did you repay him? By screwing his brother and his father, and then plotting to murder him. And then you let this a-hole molest your 13-year-old daughter. What kind of a monster are you? You're not worth the effort. He moved on to Dan. And you, you swore to uphold the law, but you don't even know what the law is, do you? You screw your son's wife, and then you plot to have him murdered. You're a bigger piece of shit than Robert, you know that? He stood back and kicked Dan in the groin as well. To hell with you. To hell with all of you. He stood up and handed the taser back to Mario's man, thanking him. Then he turned to Mario. Is there anything else, Mr. De Silva? He asked. 
Mario shook his head. No, he said. I just thought you might like to say goodbye. John looked at the three people shackled before him. Goodbye, and good riddance. He looked at Mario before continuing. You know, I actually thought about killing them myself, once. But I made a promise I wouldn't cross that line, and I'm a man of my word. Mario nodded his head before motioning John away. I know that about you, Officer Wilson, he said quietly. John looked at him, surprised. Oh yes, I know who you are. I also know your daughter is attending UCLA this fall. She wants to be a prosecuting attorney, John said. And I'm sure she'll be a good one, Mario said. Don't worry, John. I don't have a problem with honest prosecutors doing their job. I have attorneys who take care of those matters for me. I do, however, have a problem with people who double-cross me, as these three will soon find out. And like you, I, too, am a man of my word. I'm also a devoted family man. You've been given a gift most of us would never get, a real second chance at life. So please, take care of your daughter, be a good man to Ms. Johnson and live a long, happy, and healthy life. He extended his hand to John, who accepted it. Via con Dios, my friend, Mario said. Thank you, John responded. You do the same, Mr. De Silva. Mario smiled. Please call me Mario, he said. All my friends do. John nodded his head. Vaya con Dios, Mario es sed. Mario smiled as he nodded his head. He motioned for the two men to take John home. They obeyed, blindfolding him again and leading him out to the car. A little less than an hour later, the blindfold was taken off and John was handed his phone. One of the men handed John a large bottle of brandy. A token of Mr. De Silva's appreciation, one of the men said. Please express my gratitude to Mr. De Silva, John said. The men nodded their heads before leaving. John watched to make sure the sedan left and sat down at his table. He pulled out his phone and noticed his hand was shaking. He grabbed a cup of coffee and stepped on the balcony to light up a cigarette, hoping to calm his nerves. After he had settled down a bit, he called Ben. John, are you okay? Ben asked. I lost all signals from your phone. Yeah, I'm okay, John said. He recalled his encounter with Mario and the three cheaters who destroyed his life. That explains a lot, Ben said. I lost all signal from their house. It's almost as if they jammed all the electronic signals before they nabbed Robert and Lydia. It's probably a good thing you got Jenny out of there when you did. I agree. They ended the call and John finished his cigarette, staring out over the balcony. About five o'clock that evening, he went to Liz's apartment and knocked on the door. Jenny answered and let him in. He hugged his daughter tight. Dad, are you okay? She asked. Yeah, I'm just so glad to see you, he said. Well, I'm glad to see you too, Jenny responded. Liz called, said she's probably going to be quite late. What do you think about just calling out for some pizza? Pizza sounds good to me. I brought a deck of cards. You want to see if you can beat the old man in a game of spades? Jenny smiled remembering the card games she used to play with her father when she was younger. I've had lots of practice since the last time we played, she said. He pulled out the cards. Well, let's see what you've got, he said. They grabbed a notepad and a pencil, sat at the table and played spades until Liz called John. He answered the phone, observing that it was now nine o'clock and they had been playing for more than three hours. Hi, John, Liz said when he answered. Have you seen the news? No. Jenny's been beating my pants off at spades, John said. What's going on? You'd better turn on the news, she said. It looks like De Silva has taken care of Robert and Lydia. I'm sorry, but I've been doing interviews all night, and I'm going to be stuck here for at least another couple hours covering this story. Can you guys handle dinner on your own? No problem, John said. We were thinking about calling out for pizza. Pizza's perfect. I'm sorry, John. I'll be home as soon as I can she said. I understand. We'll be here, John said. Thanks for letting us know. He ended the call then turned on the television and searched for the local news and found a channel that was covering the story. This just into eyewitness news, an announcer said. The home of state Senate candidate Robert Wilson burned to the ground tonight. The bodies of three persons, one woman and two men, were discovered by firefighters. It's not known what started the fire, but authorities say they are investigating and have not ruled out foul play. It's believed the bodies included Mr. Wilson and his wife Lydia. 
Stay tuned to Eyewitness News for updates as they come in. Jenny gasped and collapsed in tears as the news came in. John was hurt as well, but more for his daughter than anything else. He held her as she sobbed, soaking his shirt with her tears. His phone rang, and he sat Jenny down before answering it, seeing the call was from Ben. Did you see the news? Ben asked. Yes, I did, John said. Did you have any idea this was going to happen? He asked. No, I didn't, John said. Were they alive when you saw them last? Ben asked. Yes, they were, John said. I made Liz a promise and I kept it. Okay, I believe you, Ben said. I'll let you know if I hear anything. Take care of Liz and Jenny. I will, John said before ending the call. Jenny looked at him after he set his phone down. Did you have anything to do with this? Jenny asked through her tears. No, I didn't, John said. I made a promise to Liz. I admit I wanted them to feel some pain, and there was a time I would have killed them for what they did to you and I. But no, I had nothing to do with this. You swear to me on a stack of Bibles, she asked. If that's what it takes, he said. Have I ever lied to you? No, you haven't, she said. He held her as she mourned for her mother. John's phone rang again, and he saw the call was from Liz. Hi, Liz, what's up? John, please tell me you had no knowledge of this, she said. No, I had no knowledge of this, he said. Good. I had to tell the police where Jenny is and they'll be coming by soon. No doubt they're going to have some questions. I'll be leaving here soon, and we can talk when I get home, okay? Okay, John said. How's Jenny? Liz asked. She's upset, naturally, but she'll be okay, I think, he said. Okay, look after her, and I'll see you in a bit, she replied. Sounds good. I'll go ahead and order the pizza, John said. They said their goodbyes and ended the call. John called a local Domino's Pizza and ordered two large pizzas for them. He sat with Jenny until he heard a knock at the door. He answered the door and saw two large LAPD officers, one of whom was Sergeant Taggart, an officer he worked with 10 years ago. Is Miss Jennifer Wilson here? The sergeant asked. Yes, John said. Please come in. The officers entered, with Taggart looking at him closely. Who are you, by the way? Taggart asked. Smith. John Smith, he said. I'm a friend of Miss Johnson's, and I'm here looking after Jenny. Do you have any ID? Taggart asked. John nodded his head and pulled out his driver's license. Taggart looked at it carefully and handed it back to him. Can you account for your whereabouts since about five o'clock this evening? He asked. Yes, John said. I left home about five o'clock and came straight here. I've been here with Miss Wilson ever since. He looked at the table, where the cards were still laid out. She pretty much wiped me out in spades this evening. Taggart looked at the table and nodded his head before looking back at John. You remind me of someone I used to work with a long time ago, Taggart said. Do you know the Wilsons? No, I don't, John said. Taggart nodded his head before turning to Jenny. Miss Wilson? He asked Jenny. Jenny looked at him, tears running down her cheeks. I hate to tell you this, but your mother, father and your grandfather were killed in a fire at their home this evening, he said. Robert wasn't my father, she said. He was my uncle when my mother married him. I see, Taggart said. Would you mind telling us why you're here? She looked at John before answering. My uncle has been molesting me since I was 13. Miss Johnson found out and invited me to stay here until I start college in the fall. Taggart nodded his head in sympathy. Did you ever report this to anyone? He asked. Yes, I did, she said. Twice. But no one did anything and my mother threatened me if I reported it again. Taggart looked shocked. He met Lydia years ago when she was married to her first husband and had a hard time believing she would allow this to happen to her daughter. I'm sorry, Miss Wilson, both for your loss and for what happened to you, he said. Jenny looked at him, her eyes suddenly growing hard. Taggart recognized that look as he had seen it in her father a few times before he was murdered. I'm not sorry they're dead, Jenny said angrily. I am glad. They conspired to murder my father. Then she let that scum sucker assaulted me over and over again. Taggart listened to her as she unloaded. I understand, Miss Wilson. I knew your father and he was a damn good cop, he said before handing her his card. If there's anything I can do, please feel free to call me. There's also a number for a grief counselor. 
I suggest you take advantage of it. He stood and faced John. Mr. Smith, if you care for this girl, I strongly suggest you get her some counseling soon, he said before leaving. The pizza came shortly after the officers left, and Liz walked in a few minutes later. Jenny was still on the couch, wiping her eyes. Liz gave her a hug before going into the kitchen, where John was cutting the pizza. She could tell something was on his mind. After he cut the pizza and dished it out, he turned to Liz and Jenny. We need to talk, he said. He set their pizza on the table and invited them to join him. What's going on, John? Liz asked. First of all, I promise you both I had absolutely nothing to do with what happened tonight. I made a promise to you, Liz, and I'm a man of my word. I was contacted by De Silva's people early this morning. They took me somewhere, I don't know where, they blindfolded me and drove around in circles, and I saw them. Lydia, Robert, and Dan. I had words with them. Strong words. I hit Robert. But I swear to you both they were alive when I left, and I had no idea this was going to happen. I thought De Silva's people would rough them up a bit, but that's all. The girls looked at John before speaking. I believe you, John, Liz said, and I appreciate your honesty here tonight. Jenny hugged her father. I believe you too, Dad, she said. John's eyes watered a bit before he spoke. Liz noticed and gave him a questioning look. There was a time when I wanted to kill them for what they did to me and for what they did to you, Jenny, he said, tears falling down his cheek. Then I met you all over again, Jenny, and I met you, Liz. And I learned that I'm not the same man I was ten years ago. That man could have easily killed all three of them without breaking a sweat. But that's not me anymore. Something De Silva said to me suddenly made sense. You spoke to De Silva himself? Liz asked. John nodded his head. Yes, I did. He told me I was given a special gift. A chance at a new life. A life with you, Liz and with you, Jenny. I'm not the man I was ten years ago, Liz. I am sorry. Liz hugged him as he cried. No, you're not the same man and you have no need to apologize. You're a better man than you were ten years ago. After they hugged and cried for a while, Liz looked at John. You know, it's been a long day and it's late. Why don't you stay here with us tonight? She asked. Yeah, I can rack out on the couch, he said. Liz and Jenny shook their heads. I won't hear of it. If it's okay with your daughter, I'd like you to stay with me. Jenny smiled. Are you sure? John asked. Oh yes, my love. There's plenty of room in my bed, she said. But remember, I'm strictly a one-man woman and I expect the same from my man. John smiled. It's a deal, he said, kissing her. He looked at Jenny. Are you okay with this? Oh yes, dad, she said. I'm more than okay with this. They hugged a bit longer finished their pizzas and headed for bed. After a night of soft lovemaking, John woke up with a naked Liz wrapped around his body. I can get used to this, he thought to himself with a smile. Six months later, John and Liz were married. Ben was John's best man and Ginny was Liz's maid of honor. Life was looking good. The autopsies revealed that Robert, Lydia, and Dan had all died of smoke inhalation. Fire investigators found that an electrical short in the old house sparked the fire which quickly spread through the old wooden house, aided by piles of paperwork and old legal books Robert and Lydia had collected over the years. Jenny went to UCLA and split her time between the college and her father's condo. Although John didn't have to get a job, he went into business with Ben, working as a private investigator. There was, however, one loose end he had to take care of. One day, Jenny called to tell him that his mother, Barbara, was in the hospital with a terminal form of cancer complicated by bouts of dementia. According to the doctors, the old woman wasn't expected to live much longer. John took Jenny and Liz to see her one last time. As he walked into the hospital room, he took note of his mother's condition. She slowly opened her eyes and looked at John. Tears started falling down her cheek. Avery, she asked weakly, is that really you? He sat down next to her. She looked closely at his face. Oh my God, Avery. I'm so sorry for everything. Can you ever forgive me? He took her frail form in his arms and hugged her. My name is now John Smith, he whispered. But yes, it's really me. And yes, I forgive you, he added, tears running down his face. She began sobbing as he held her. They held each other for several minutes before she began to get tired. 
He laid her down and smiled at her. Thank you, John. I can die in peace now. Exhausted, she went asleep. They left the room as she slept. She died a few weeks later, but had managed to change her will in the meantime, splitting her considerable assets evenly between John and Jenny. John made the arrangements for her funeral, burying her next to her husband. Looking at the four graves of his previous family, John realized that De Silva was right. He had, indeed, been given a special gift, and he intended to make the best of his new lease on life. Dear listeners, please share your thoughts in the comments section below, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.